I have seen numerous startups working on compostability, working on bioengineering, biomaterials, and it seems they are attacking the same problem of reducing the carbon footprint using biomaterials that are directly compostable, so on and so forth. Uh, there have been a lot of advancements in terms of materials, but not a lot of advancement in terms of these materials being effectively used by the industry. I think Han understands that point, that point very, very well. She has a very balanced viewpoint, and I think that is what differentiates this startup with respect to the others who are working in the same space. Welcome to Scouted by Gravy. Today we are in talks with Han Do, who is the CEO of Bio. It's a bio materials based company that is trying to reduce uh, plastic and they are doing upcycling and reducing carbon footprint as well. I think there is a very fine balance between technical performance of these materials and over engineering. It's a good platform to learn more about biofermentation, use of biomaterials, upcycling and very interesting takes from Han on the regulations and their roles in motivating such kind of startups. By the way, I mean, as a bonus point, I never knew that Vietnam was such a good platform for deep tech startups. Han also talks about that. Let's take a deep dive in. One of the first questions that was coming to my mind when uh, I looked at bio was that there are so many companies out there which are working on similar problem statements. In such a scenario, how does bio differentiate itself from all the startups and all the other players who are competing in this space? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, first of all, yeah, I think we join the same mission with many other companies in the market to address the plastic waste crisis. So what we aim for is to reduce as much as possible on the plastic footprints on our planet. Um, what mm -hmm. differentiates ourselves from others is um, first, we decided not to work on plastic recycling because we feel like this marketplace is already quite crowded with many mm -hmm. different players. And secondly, only 10% of all the plastic waste uh, can be recycled. 90% will remain in the environment for a very long time, like between 500 to 1,000 years. So that's why mm -hmm. when we started bio, we decided to um, tackle the uh, plastic um, alternative, which means an alternative material to replace plastics. And uh, we realize that Vietnam is a big agricultural producing country with a lot of bio waste resources sitting around. But then we didn't really manage to, to fully utilize uh, this uh, valuable resource. So that's why we work on the technology that will convert this bio waste resource into a new bio based material to replace plastics. Uh, and yet there are many other different players in the market who are also offering the bio based solutions to replace plastics. But most of the solutions so far, I think the majority of the first generation technology are using starch as a raw material uh, to make yes. bioplastics. And we also realize that starch is a, also a very valuable uh, food crop resource for people and for animals. So yes. we want to preserve this resource as food. And uh, we don't want to take out any farming resource from our planet to make plastics. That's why we think it's a more beautiful concept to try to utilize and upcycle the waste, the secondary waste that is being discharged to the environment so that we can preserve the pri primary resource like, like, like um, starch or food crops for, uh, for, for food security. Um, the second that set us apart from others is um, also uh, because we upcycle waste. So we work on waste management and upcycling so we can generate much lower carbon footprint compared to mm -hmm. other solutions which are using the primary resources from our nature. Yes. Um, the third is um, our material also um, has a, a very high bio-based content and is fully biodegradable in the natural environment uh, unlike many other bioplastic solutions which still require an industrial composting condition um, yes. to decompose. So those are the few key areas that we differentiate ourselves uh, by our technology. Uh, and um, at Bio, we, we own naturally we own two separate patented technologies. The first is the material engineering technology 
that we compound bio waste with other biopolymers to create a biocomposite for packaging application. And the mm -hmm. second is a biofermentation technology that we use a nutrition left over from bio waste to feed our propriety bacterial strains. And this bacteria will generate a bio core material that 100% bio based and bio compatible. And then we can develop this material for applications in the medical or cosmetic or textile sectors. Understood, understood. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. So with respect to the application area, you know where your niche is, where I mean your end product, the biomaterials that are being produced can be used for packaging. With respect to sourcing, you already have a geography where bio waste is in ample. So you have the raw material and you have the output that is being consumed by the medical and the cosmetics industry. Now, one of the things when I talk to larger companies who are the end consumers, mm -hmm. say for example, cosmetics, mm -hmm. uh, all the giants of the world. So I was talking to them and one of the things that they mentioned was the acceptance of biomaterials as a packaging alternative is something where people find two obstacles. One is cost mm -hmm. because traditionally Plastics are much, much cheaper. Mm. The systems are set. It's much easier to mold, seal, and all those right. kind of things. And the mm. second portion is that the ecosystem required to make it compostable. You already answered that. I mean, it does not require industrial grade compostable mm. facility. Mm. It can be done in, in a, uh, an agricultural setting or a normal setting. Mm. But these were traditionally the two things mm. that actually prevent people from mm. rapidly accepting this as an answer. Mm. So how are you guys working on the cost factor as well as on, 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 say, for example, if you have a giant as a client, say, for example, the L'Oreal's of the world or, or anybody of that nature, or say, for example, Kraft Heinz. So there, the volume of end products is also going to be very, very huge, mm. which means postability, collection and all those ecosystem part, waste collection and management is also going to play a crucial role. Is bio working on such problem statement that are not centrally linked to your material and the output, but rather to how it will be consumed by the consumers and management. Mm. Yeah, I think that's an interesting perspective uh, because yes, indeed, I think the two factors that you mentioned are the key barriers to compostable material. First is the cost and second is the infrastructure for composting. Mm -hmm. And with our material, then we can address the second challenge. For the cost challenge, indeed, um, the thin there's a gap quite a significant gap between regular plastic and the new alternative material in general. Uh, but for our solution, because we can utilize the discarded bio waste, which is available at a very low cost. So that could mm -hmm. also help us to drive down our cost structure and make our solution more, more competitive uh, price-wise. Uh, so in mm -hmm. fact, our material is more cost competitive than most other bioplastic solution in the market. Um, and it's comparable to other nature-based material like wood or silver cane or paper. But still, okay. for mass scale adoption, um, I think um, first we need scale. So if we have volume, we have brands, we have big brands, we have big companies, big corporates like you mentioned, who are willing to play the role of the champion of the market drivers to have small startups, small suppliers, small solution providers like Bio to really scale up. Uh, then we can uh, achieve the better economy of scale over time. Uh, and secondly, I think policy and regulations also play a very important role because if the government uh, and regulators, they can also provide incentives uh, and, uh, mm, yeah, and, and financial uh, motivation uh, for new solutions to become more cost competitive against regular plastic, then I think over time, certainly we will reach a point that um, the adoption rate is higher uh, consumers mm -hmm. are incentivized to use this kind of new solutions, then I think it will become the story like solar energy. So over time, solar energy will, has become like comparable um, to regular energy uh, in terms of pricing. So I, I do hope that in the future, when we have the market scale, we have the policies um, to be the drivers, we have the consumer uh, perception and willingness to try the new solution, then um, we can reach a point that we, we will become much more cost competitive. Understood, understood. That makes sense. And I think that's in alignment with the long term future and the vision that mm -hmm. most governments and regulatory bodies have, mm -hmm. which brings me to the next question. I want to talk about regulation. I mean, recently in Europe, ESPR has been implemented, which talks about recyclability and then PPWR, another policy is in force. Mm -hmm. And this is about compostability. And I have been getting a lot of 
inquiries because people yet don't understand what these regulations are, are, are in general and how it is going to impact each and every packaging that they are using, right? Mm. So I think one of the things that I have noticed as an observer is that regulations are such that companies find it tough to figure out which of their products are affected, mm. which makes the action a bit slower in terms of talking to their suppliers, finding out new vendors, scouting for new people who can actually solve their problem. Mm. What is your opinion in general on the regulation authorities and the regulations that come on? Mm. And I think, I mean, there are timelines that are as close as 2025 and mm. 2030 mm. for mass adaptability of compostability. Mm. Mm. Now, from a regulation perspective, this is great. But from an industry perspective and also from the ecosystem and supplier perspective, mm. I don't know how people are ready mm. or able to. Mm. What, so there are two questions to it. One is your opinion on the regulation and the way it is implemented. And second, do you think or what level of readiness in general startups like yours or, or other companies who are working in this and the end consumers are right now to meet the timelines of 2025 and 2030 goals? Mm. that are coming up with regulations. Mm, mm, mm. Yeah, I see. Thank you for the question. Um, I first, um, first question, um, I think um, there's a, quite a variety of different regulations and policies among different markets. So yes. it's a very, um, uh, it's quite a complex picture. Uh, in yes. some markets, regulators and policies are more advanced, uh, more like uh, forward uh, looking, for example, in the European market. Further yes. in some other parts of the world where regulations and policy are still lagging behind. So for the new solution like our technologies, um, we also need to really build on around those markets um, where the regulations and policies are more ready. And that could give us a better market incentives yeah, um, to yeah. really scale up. Uh, so right now, um, we, we really focus on those markets who we can leverage the policy incentives and regulations. Yeah. Um, I would say that um, in order to create a better market opportunity for this line new solution which address um, big problems uh, for our planet and bring the benefits for consumers and, 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 and environment in general, regulators and policy makers need to spend more time to try to really catch up with technology advancements mm -hmm. in the market mm -hmm. because I know uh, technology is moving very fast. New solutions are coming up every day and sometimes like maybe policy regulators are very busy with many different, um, you know, uh, yeah. yeah, many different priorities and, and, and workloads that they may not be able to, to really catch up with the latest um, technology trends. So when they are not fully updated on the latest technology trends, then usually, um, there's a lot of policy lobbying, a lot of uh, interest groups try to influence the policy making process. Okay. Um, so sometimes it may create some um, challenges or uh, barriers for the policies to be really um, working in favor of the most, uh, eco-friendly of the most, like green um, solutions. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, so I think, and also I understand the challenges because um, um, when we talk about the bio-based or biodegradable materials, there are so many different technologies and options, and some are um, greener than others. Uh, not to mention there are a lot of greenwashing as well. So policies yes. and regulators also need to be very um, cautious, need to be very uh, considerate when uh, they decide uh, which material we should, we should promote and which are really not bringing the benefits for the general yeah. public. So, uh, so I would say there need to be more consultation. There needs to be more updates and catching up with the latest technology trends so that the policies coming out can really uh, help to promote um, the most um, holistic and the most like, impactful solutions. And uh, for uh, startups like Bio, we are, I think we are fully ready. We, we are looking forward to those policies and regulations. So a good policy a good regulation also helps set apart good solutions versus like not very good solutions. I would say. Yeah. You're right. You're right. Clean, I mean, clean up the market. Yeah. Yes. yes. I think you were talking about technology. Now, when I deal with the packaging side of things, when I talk to industry experts, consumers, big giants, one of the problems that I faced was that there is a lot of innovation, like you were talking about, on the material side of things. 
to producing something like what bio is producing, which is biodegradable plastic or bio waste based products. Mm -hmm. Now, till this point of time where you have a finished product usable for packaging, it's all good because there is a lot of innovation going on. Mm. But when the last mile happens, which is taking these solutions and using it in their products, say for example, food, ketchup, cosmetics, there are other factors that come into play. So for example, especially in food kind of packaging or flexible packaging, there needs to be a lot of barriers to moisture, to oxygen, to to other, Mm -hmm. right? Then also, I mean, there are brand images associated to how the product comes out of the packaging. So for example, if it is very smooth flowing, a cosmetic, Mm -hmm. that gives a good impression as compared to, Mm -hmm. because of new material, the the flowability becomes much more viscous, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. I have seen these integration or last mile issues happening. Mm. Even large players who are trying to adopt the compostable materials, who are trying to adopt much more recyclable or greener uh, solutions. Ultimately, what they are shying away from is it's ultimately also going to affect their brand because the the physical and the chemical and the shelf life properties are not yet there mm. as compared to... That's to, true. To, mm. Right. So that also is something that I have seen is coming as a pushback mm. or rather yep. complexity that the end consumers have to solve as compared to mm. people who are really innovative like you mm. uh, actually working on the material side of things and mm. taking to a place where you have end product that can be used by mm. 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 so your opinion on how if bio has certain elements in its innovative products mm. bring these factors mm. and in general is this one of the reasons because of which the adaptability is not as rapid as mm. it would have been? Mm. Yeah, I, I think that's true. That's a, a very practical issue and challenge that um, we are also um, working out with our customers as well as I think for other like solution providers. Um, and uh, we, we have to accept that uh, nature-based material has its limitation in terms of technical performance and we can never reach um, that um, the perfect uh, equation like the regular plastics. Uh, yeah. But also I think we need to consider silver points here. Uh, it's a technical letter that we need to really um, climb up over time. So if um, there's a champion, a market champion who is willing really to take on the challenge of promoting greener, more sustainable solution, they would be willing to also to to accompany and to support the solution providers like us to really climb mm-hmm. up the technical challenge over time, which means that they may also compromise some of the technical requirements in the initial stage. Uh, we can work together um, they provide us our the technical support. We we um, go with the less technically challenging application first, and then we build our know how, our expertise, and over time we can improve, and we can tackle the more kind of like challenging technical um, problems. Um, second, mm-hmm. I think um, also we need to um, really consider the necessity of over engineering because maybe sometimes the regular plastic is too is available at a very big scale and it's too cheap enough. So people tend to, I think we, we, we have come to the habit of over-engineering, like just for regular packaging, then we, we do over-packaging with too many different layers, like too many different coating uh, solutions. Um, that may not be all of that. that. Some of that can be streamlined and, and eliminated. Um, so imagine like we went back to the our our past before we invented the regular plastic. Uh, I believe that um, when we use all the nature based material for packaging in the past in the old time, then we, we don't need to over engineer and create so many different uh, layers of, of, of coating uh, of packaging for for a simple product. So I think it really go back to the question of balancing between uh, use cases and uh, the social and the packaging solution that is needed. It comes to to the willingness of the market players who are willing to work together to climb up the technical ladder and address the more challenging issues um, together over time. That's a refreshing view because I mean it actually talks about balance. Most people don't talk about balance; they talk more about how their products are better and how they can make it better. Mm. Thank you for sharing that view. And uh, I also wanted to ask about Vietnam as a geography for for boosting startups. Now I see, I mean, a lot of agri-based startups, a lot of packaging-based startups, as well as a lot of raw material-based startups for paper and pulp and textile industry are cropping up there. But 
but I don't have a lot of idea and I don't think a lot of audience will be looking at this and reading this have a lot of idea as to how huge Vietnam market is in terms of the agri-tech and the packaging space. I mean, can you share your experiences, your opinion so far? Has it been easy for you to come to this stage from the beginning when, when you started? Mm. Yeah, uh, in the Vietnam, I think it's one of the biggest markets in Southeast Asia. We have like 100 million people and we are yes. one of the top agricultural produ producers in the world. So I would say agri-tech, uh, climate tech, um, really like growing very fast in Vietnam. Uh, when it comes to deep tech, material science, in the past we didn't really have many startups in this area mm -hmm. in Vietnam. But recently I started to see more and more, especially in the ESG arena. So uh, mm -hmm. I think um, uh, partly because um, also the maturity, the sophistication of the founders in Vietnam is also improving. And also we see that um, that's a big challenge for our economy and for our country. Uh, and also, I think Vietnam has a very big advantage that we shouldn't underestimate. That is, uh, we are very efficient, cost efficient for um, R&D. So, um, like, uh, the solution that we develop in Vietnam it may cost only a fraction of um, the cost that it would take otherwise in other countries. So, I think for us as a deep tech company, uh, I feel like Vietnam is a very good platform um, for us to develop the technology and grow it from here because um, yeah, the Andy cost is very reasonable. We have a lot of science um, manpower and talents. Uh, we have a very dynamic um, ecosystem of uh, uh, companies, corporates, entrepreneurs and scientists uh, working together. Um, and we have uh, we are at the center of also Southeast Asia. So um, any solutions developed in Vietnam, we can also try out easily in the neighboring countries like Thailand or Indonesia, yeah, Singapore. So, so I would say, um, yeah, I feel like um, we, we had a very good home uh, starting point to, to build our company here. I think after listening to you and, and describe the ecosystem of Vietnam and its raw materials as well as the knowledge in the people that is there with respect to science and technology background, uh, my personal opinion is that Vietnam is slightly underrepresented in the media when it comes to startup ecosystems mm. as well as science and technology startup. But that's my opinion. Mm. So, that's why I wanted to ask you that question and, and let our audience know, I mean, mm. what the real ground level scenario is. And of course, there is no meeting the cost benefit. As long as it's same or better value at a lower mm. cost, I don't think there is any barrier which will stop anybody from utilizing the resources and the people and the startups mm. there in Vietnam. Yeah. Uh, I also wanted to talk about uh, you and your journey and specifically since beginning to this point, what were the two challenges that actually uh, made you think that, hey, I mean, this is not for me or maybe, I mean, this is too tough. Was there some kind of situation like that? And second, uh, the, the second part is a follow on question as to what's the future for bio? I mean, how do you plan to move ahead? What's the vision going ahead? Mm -hmm. So the first part of the question is about the challenges, right? The biggest challenges that that uh, I was facing, right? Um, um, I think to me, of course, uh, founding a company, uh, building up a company is always challenging, uh, not only for myself, but I think for every founder. Um, I would say for a female founder particularly, uh, I think um, one challenge is also time management and work-life balance. So how you can really like commit to a very, very challenging yes. journey, but at the same time, you also need to also fulfill all the family responsibilities. Uh, I have two kids, I have a family, um, oh. and I travel between Hanoi and Ho Chi Minh all the time because our company is based in Ho Chi Minh, but I'm based in Hanoi physically. Um, and um, I think uh, the challenge, the second challenge is um, um, scaling up because now we are, we are at the stage yes. of scaling up. Uh, so um, the market potential is huge. Uh, so now how we can scale up fast enough that um, also uh, we can uh, fill in and build a team of um, talents uh, that can really... Um, so somehow I, I need to really start to build a talent pool around me so that we can take on a much bigger um, scale of growth uh, and um, yeah, a, more, uh, a much more aggressive and ambitious um, um, agenda. Uh, so those are the two challenges for me at this point. Um, other than that, I, I don't see that it's uh, too much challenging. 
um, I think our mission, our agenda, our values are fully supported by all the partners that we are working with. We have a great team. Um, funding is not an issue. Uh, market is not an issue. Um, customers are very supportive. We are very fortunate to work with the like the one biggest companies, and they are like AB and Beth, and they are very supportive uh, for our yeah. mission. So other than the two like more kind of challenges I mentioned, um, I think everything else um, are going very well. Um, and secondly, the second part is how I see bio in the next journey, right? Yeah, so I, I think I, I, I cover that in, in, the, yes. in the first question as well. I think it's about scaling up, how fast yeah. we can scale up uh, and also go beyond Vietnam, uh, how we can also bring this technology to other markets. Uh, so that we don't only serve the global market, our Asia, but also we bring this technology to other parts um, of the world, and then we we can really localize, uh, build the footprint there, license the technology, build the networks of uh, partners in different markets, so that we can serve the global market more efficiently. Understood. And again, I mean, this is a pet question. I usually ask startup founders about this, and this is about the intellectual property now. When you are working on the material side of things, whether it is the process of converting the bio waste into end products, whether it is a new material that is being generated in the process or whether it is some catalyst that is actually doing the magic, there is always something that is worth protecting through a patent, through, through a trade secret, whatever. What's your opinion in general about the usefulness of patents to startup like yours, considering that when you are starting, you are trying to get as much funding as possible to use for product development and business development as compared to on the intellectual property strategy. So in, in context of startups, how important are patents for you? And what's the usefulness? I mean, if, if you have filed for patents? Mm. Yeah, I think it really depends on the business nature of the startups. So for bio, because we are a deep tech company, so patent and, and IP protection is very important. Um, and because we are position, we position ourselves as a technology company, not a manufacturing company. So that's yes. why most of our funding, I think, we go into R&D, we go into IP protection, we go into um, product development. We don't go into like uh, investing in capex machine and scaling up manufacturing. Of course, we still need to scale up so that we can build our brand in the market, educate the market, uh, look in customer. Um, yeah. Uh, generate revenues, but as I mentioned, our business model in the future will not be uh, just focused on manufacturing, but uh, on uh, uh, technology licensing. And in order to do that, we, we need to be fully protect our IPs in the first place before we, we can license it out. So I, I think for us, uh, pattern and IPs are very important. One of the most important things yeah, for the company. Yeah, I mean, if, if the business is going to be ultimately pivoting on the technology licensing part, I mean, there is no beating around the bush. I mean, you need patents mm. and you need strong patents, patents that cannot be invalidated in any court. Mm. So, so, forth. so that means and uh, considering the future plans that we're talking about expanding outside Vietnam, <clears throat> the proactive patent strategy would be to file in as many potential markets as possible. I mean, is that the strategy? Uh, for, for hmm. uh, of course, we would love to fight in as many markets as possible, but for small startup, we also need to consider the cost implications. So I think we need to identify the key strategic markets that we see the most potential, and then we find those markets first. I actually was talking to somebody yesterday, and they were working on producing silica from ash hmm. generated from our plants. And they will, the end consumer was a tire industry. I mean, so they were using it as a filler. Now, uh, I was talking to them and one of the things that I asked them, of course, was about IP and, and patents. And it seems that the more answers that I've got, there is one common factor and that is the WIPO route, that you file a WIPO application and you get 30, 31 months of window where you can file in any of the participating mm. jurisdiction as compared to simply trying to find a local uh, file a local patent like in Vietnam mm. or Thailand mm. Or mm. Mm. so I just wanted to share that information with you that mm. there is that route, that route. you yeah. may already be aware about that yep. uh, but that gives you some thinking time yeah that's exactly you can 
I think, yeah, I yeah. think that's the strategy that we are we are using now. So we file for BCT first, so that we yes. have been thirty months to go to decide like which um national phase uh, application that we should file for each market. Mm. So that would help us to buy more time to validate the markets, identify mm. the other priorities, and also to defer the cost <laughs> implications. Yeah. Mm. I think, I'm, I mean, this opens up a lot of questions for me, but that will be a topic for a different day because when the end game is also technology licensing, when you are projecting yourself as a technology company, then it's not just the innovations that you are doing, but also the white spaces that are out there, the adjacencies that are related to your technology and your process, all of those things need to be protected mm. as compared to your your core innovations that are there. And mm. that that brings into picture a lot of budgeting, right? Mm. Because I mean, it's the legal cost and the filing cost and the maintenance cost that actually shoots up mm. as, as you become a much more mature company. Mm. Uh, but maybe you already have a strategy in place for that. Maybe you have already started with somebody who has expertise in intellectual property mm. management and strategy, mm. uh, if you're planning in that way. Mm. Uh, I wanted to ask all these questions, but I think our time is up mm. and, and uh, mm. you have been gracious enough to, to give a few minutes extra to me but thank you very much for answering all my questions i think it was great talking to you it was good understanding the uh, the ecosystem in vietnam it was also crucial for me to understand and for the audience to understand uh, that there are multiple ways to actually leverage technology it is not simply manufacturing but licensing as well as collaboration and partnering up where you have the technology and somebody else is doing mm. the utilization of that technology mm. and so on and so forth. Mm. But it was also interesting to understand your viewpoints on the regulatory front, because I think not a lot of startup founders have such a mature view on regulation and what a good regulation is and what a bad regulation is. Mm. So thank you for educating us and sharing your uh, opinions. Again, thank you very much. And uh, we will share the link to the final interview that will be uploaded. Mm. You will have the link to the video and the snippets. If you want to use it anywhere, if you want to share it with somebody, mm. feel free to do so. I mean, we will. If, if there is a direct interest on the article or the content generated through this interview, we will directly connect you with them. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, also, it's my pleasure to talk to you. It's a very interesting discussion. You brought up a lot of inspiring questions that I would continue to think about. Like the last part you mentioned, although we are running out of time, but I think that's a very good uh, thing that we need to think about our future business strategy. Um, and the reason I'm bringing G to join the call today is she on so help us to also manage all the um, huh? all the records and assets that we have created out of the interview today. So anything that you need us to to collaborate, um, to disseminate, and send out the information later, then I think she can help. Sure, sure. So Han, I think there is one last thing that I should mention, and that is that this is a platform that records video on both sides. So your part of the video is being recorded on your phone. And my part is being recorded on my mm. laptop. Mm. So even if we end the call, there can you give a couple of minutes for that video part from your side to get uploaded so that we uh, can so we can yeah. give it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you. So all of the things will happen automatically. All you need to do is stay for a couple of minutes on okay. the bridge, even after it okay. gets discovered. Yeah, understood. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you very much mm. for your time. Mm. Thank, thank you, you for your time. Mm. Thank you. Mm. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye.